So, uh, first things first, uh, I'm sorry, everybody was from Baltimore and I'm not from Baltimore. Well, but that's nice, right, because it's kind of different. So I'd like to take you on a journey, first of all. How many of you remember this song? Come on, put your hands up. How many of you remember this song? Not enough of you. He'll, no, I could sing the song, but you know, I'll take the whole <laughs> presentation. But this song by Michael Jackson, Heal the World, Make It a Better Place. We all love this song when we were kids, right? Because it represented something that we all wanted. We all wanted to save the world and change the world. But the thing is, yeah, we're still kids. Until we grow up and our eyes start to open. And we look at all the wrongs in this world, all the injustices. We look at the level of poverty, we look at uh, all the wars in the world, we see everything that is happening in the world. And what happens? Yeah, we just say it was just a song, nothing else. We lose that sense of dreaming and wanting to be a change maker. We become bitter, we become, uh, you know, hopeless and we become powerless. Well, today I want to take you on a journey. I want to take you to a journey and one thing I'll ask you, Live all your despair, live all your skepticism, live all your hopelessness, and go with me on this journey. And I'd like to take you somewhere that most of you probably have never been to. First of all, I'd like to ask you, how many of you admire these people? Right, we have you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, we have uh, Mother Teresa, we have Martin Luther King. Well, though these people are great, there's one problem. I can't relate to them. When I think of them, I'm like, they're up there and I'm down here. So that those are the kind of change makers that we, we know. But then I'm going to teach you a little bit. So I'd like to take you on a journey. And uh, the good thing about PowerPoint is you, you can make something look really big when it's not that big. But this is how big Rwanda is. Is that small dot there. And it's in the heart of Africa. Rwanda is known for one thing. Only one thing. And that is the genocide. In 1994, in 1994, the plane that was carrying the former president of Rwanda got shut down. And instantly, one of the worst genocide in the history of men started. In a space of 100 days, women, children, and men were killed for the sole reason of being born Tutsi. These people were killed over 100 days. It is estimated that one, pe one million people died in 100 days. That's a lot of numbers. But to just to give you a little bit of perspective, that's 10,000 people each day for 100 days. So you understand it even better. That's at least three 9-11s every day for 100 days. And while all of this was happening, the world turned its back on Rwanda. Because for the world, it was just bloody Africans killing one another. But if you are like me, it's hard to relate numbers. You don't understand, you know, it's such a big number. How do you understand that? It's important to put faces to that. And some of you might wonder, come on, the topic is about goodness. And you're talking about evil? The reason I'm doing this, I'd like to share two stories with you. And these are two of my friends. On the, on the left is Yannick, the one with a white uh, sweater. Yannick, during the genocide, he was three years old. He's the survivor of the genocide. During the genocide, his small brother that was one year old got killed in front of him. And his mother got, um, they, uh, the, they pierced her leg, so she has been uh, handicapped for the past uh, 18 years. And well, next to him is Dadi. During the genocide, Dadi lost more than 80% of his family. He lost his, both of his parents. And the only reason to why he uh, survived is because he was hiding in the church. And when he was about to be killed, someone just came up and saved him. But I'm not, I'm not sharing these stories in order to you to, for you to feel pity for them. But there's something else about them. So they were abandoned by the world. They have every reason in the world to be skeptical, every reason in the world to be angry. But this is what they decided. With other seven friends, we, with Yannick and Nadine, started a nonprofit organization called Peace and Love Proclaimers. And what we wanted to do, first of all, it was to create a platform in order for the next generation of Randans to be able to discuss how are we going to live together. Imagine, how do you put a kid who lost his parents during the genocide, and a kid whose parents was a perpetrator, 
How do you, how do you put them together on a table and make them talk to one another? But that is a task we took on. That is a task we took on because we understood that we are the only ones who can do it. That he said, I may not change my past, but I can work so that my children don't have to go through the same things that I went through. But I'm going to talk to you about a movement that we started. And this is Walk to Remember. And no, it has nothing to do with the movie. But Walk to Remember was a movement that we started to unite young people, not only in Rwanda, but in the world, in order to fight against genocide. What we did is to use our story, use whatever happened to us, and share it and tell others so that they can fight against genocide. So the first thing that we did, we started in Rwanda in 2009. And the first walk, we had approximately 10,000 people. And all of these are young people that joined us and were putting their voices in in order to fight against genocide. And this is the walk that happened in 2009. However, in 2010, we said it's not enough. Because of course, you know, people in Rwanda, the young people in Rwanda, they kind of know what happened to them because they're all living in the aftermath of genocide. So what we decided to do is to go to the region, the East African region. And we decided to go to six countries in 2010. And we united young people in East Africa to fight against genocide, sharing our stories. But then that itself was not enough because we had that burden. And we decided that we're gonna go broader. In 2011, we decided that we're gonna go broader. So we went to nine countries and four continents. And in those nine countries and four continents, what we did is share our stories and try to prevent genocide. In 2012, one of the things that we did, we did again the walk this year. And it's, uh, if you look at the picture, the person in the middle is the president of Rwanda, who gave us the honor to be there. So, just this year alone, we're able to do the walk in 10 countries, 22 locations and four continents. We're able to gather more than 50,000 people to join us and remember what happened in Rwanda. But remembrance in itself is not that great. What we wanted is us to be able to give a face to those numbers that people know, those numbers that we hear all the time, but also use our stories in order to inspire others to fight against genocide. So, what lesson can we get from this? Well, if you look at the picture, actually, uh, these are, I think, approximately 5,000 candles that were lit at the 15th commemoration of the genocide. But it's more than just about the picture. It is about hope. If anyone in this world has a reason, an under and justified reason, to be skeptical, to be hopeless, to decide that they're going to have a pity party, it's us. It is us, Randis, we have the reason because the world abandoned us. However, there's a great quote that says that we are all a product of our past, but we are not prisoners of it. We decided that we're going to go beyond it. We decided that we're going to use our stories, we're going to use whatever happened to us in order to shape the future, not only for us, but for the world. And as I was thinking about, you know, how do I end my presentation, uh, I try to find all the funny things to say, but I couldn't find it. So I'm just going to leave you with one quote, a quote that one of our members said. And she said, what if I think we deserve better? Certainly the child who chanted his plea deserves better. I'm told that my beliefs and hopes are unrealistic. But I say that any, everyone walking this planet has a moral responsibility to bring positive change. I want to stand up and walk away from my prejudices and my hurts. I want to build a bridge for a better tomorrow. Through Walk to Remember, I have come to learn that we're all entwined in one dream, that we're all the sole writers of our collective future. No one can rightly claim that it will be easy to wake up one day and decide to love the people that you've been taught to hate. But through this organization, I know it is possible. It requires us to lay down our pride and I'm learning how to do this. Though there's a, a looming fear of history repeating itself, and while I may know that there's a future, and while I may walk alone in my hopes and dreams, I know there's a future of healing and gracious forgiveness. There's a future for that little boy to grow up and to become a poet and break free of all the chains of past hatred. There's a future for my daughter to 
as she looks at life through rose tainted glasses and see the good in people. There's a future for me to give blindly, to love blindly, and to leave behind a legacy of my own. So you can change the world. You just got to do it one step at a time. Thank you.